Okay, um, so I'll get started, shall I? Um, so I think most of you already know who I am, um, but I'm Linz, uh, Lindsay. Um, I'm a Romance in the Gothic regular uh, as a member of the audience, but this is my first time actually doing a talk. Um, I'm going to be looking at the geological Gothic, which is a thing that I've been kind of swirling around in my head for, for a little while. Um, it's really just at the beginning of me working out what it is. So this is really a way of, uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, clarify my own thinking by explaining, but also get a bit of feedback. So if anybody's got any other thoughts or ideas, I would very much appreciate those. Um, okay, my uh, Twitter handles on here and my Kofi again. Um, I'm gonna be dividing this into two parts, as Sam said, um, and timed it to about 40 minutes. There's plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm doing, mostly my focus is mountains this time. Um, there's an awful lot other, lot of other geological things I could talk about, but you know, let's not get too ambitious too early. So um, <clears throat> the two parts are these. So I'm going to start off by sort of outlining a bit of my thinking as to what geology has to do with the Gothic. Um, and I'll give you also a quick explanation of how to make a mountain range just in case you ever feel like having a go yourself. Um, yes, there are diagrams. Um, and then I'm gonna look at three examples of mountains in Gothic literature. So we've got Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jordan L. Hawke's Hoarfrost, and the podcast, Old Gods of Appalachia. And I'm gonna be mixing in geology with pieces of the text, um, hopefully demonstrating um, how Geology is inherently Gothic, I suppose. Okay, so um, what is the geological Gothic? Um, this is an image um, by uh, a Twitter friend of mine, Paul. Um, please go and follow him. He does these amazing kind of gothic -y and also really nice sci-fi type drawings. Um, brightens up the day quite a lot. So, all right, the geological Gothic. Gothic literature loves mountains and gorges and caves and mines and cliffs and crags and, and all of these things. Um, you know, they're, they're big, they're impressive, they're scary. Um, they really add to the aesthetic and, you know, there's, there's colour and perhaps um, crystals and sparkle and things. Obviously, though, at night in the rain, terrifying, um, you know, in a storm or what have you. Um, and even the, the really young ones are really, really old on a human scale. Okay. So when I say old, think really, really old. Okay. <laughs> and this is what deep time is all about. Um, so we're going to have a, a quick, uh, I'll give you a quick tour, if you like, a detour maybe, um, through the work of James Hutton, who is these days sort of considered to be the father of modern geology. Um, he was around in the 18th century, and even in his day was renowned um, as a, a, a researcher, a scientist in geology, chemistry, all kinds of things. And he was also a farmer, so his um, agricultural innovations were also much um, respected. So as a farmer, he noticed that, um, Every year he was having to dig out his drainage ditches, um, getting rid of the sediment to allow the water to flow better. And every time this happened, he watched the sediment flow down the burn into the river and out into the sea. And so he started to think about where's the sediment going because his fields are not getting any lower. <laughs> there was still the same amount of soil on the fields. So he wondered if there wasn't some, what we call recycling going on, this some kind of process that was um, making it possible for um, there still to be soil, even though soil kept getting washed away. 
And he realized that whatever process this was going to be was going to take place over a really long period of time. <coughs> so the question that he, he was thinking about was, OK, so how long is this time scale that we're thinking about? Um, and he'd, you know, he'd been seeing rocks turning up in his fields that seemed to be made of bits of older rocks with fossils or what have you in it. And he figured this is clearly ages, right? <laughs> um, but a single rock doesn't really prove anything. So he was looking for a place, a location where he felt he could show the, the sheer length of time that was going to be involved in, in the natural process this process of breaking and rebuilding. So that brings us to Sicker Point, uh, which is um, in East Lothian in Scotland. That's the photograph on the left. Um, and one day in 1788, Hutton and some pals were uh, out in their boat, poking about along the shore, um, and they found this um, geological feature. Um, this is something of a a mecca now for, for geology nerds. Um, so <laughs> beware of people in check shirts if you do go to visit. Um, so what you're looking at is a formation called an unconformity. The, the rocks in the lower center part of the picture are vertical, the way that we're looking at them. And then on top of them, there's rocks coming in from the left-hand side, which are much more horizontal. Both of these rocks are old. They're not the same rocks, but they are very, very old. So the vertical ones are 440 million, 420 million years old, something like that. And then the more horizontal ones are younger, um, as much as 80 million years younger. So 80 off 420. <coughs> Remember, though, that 80 million years is comfortably longer than the time between us here and the extinction of the large dinosaurs. Okay, so we're talking a lot of time. Obviously Hutton couldn't carbon date his rocks, um, he couldn't use fossils to work out how old things were, um, so the science wasn't sufficiently advanced at the time. So he was looking at, at the, the rocks and trying to work out how long this process might have taken so originally there would have been um, some sediment laid down flat, became rock, was pushed into a vertical position. So this is the, the, the vertical layers you can see. And then it was eroded down to a flat surface by wind, water, whatever. And then another set of layers was laid down on top of that in a horizontal direction. And then the whole lot have been sort of pushed and eroded into um, the, the formation that you can see there. So Hutton knew this must have taken a long time um, and he knew it had to be longer than the numbers that, that biblical scholars were coming up with for the age of the earth. So sort of 6,000 years or 7,000 years. Um, it's, it's just not long enough. And so this is where he came up with this idea of deep time. This idea that the earth is almost unimaginably old and it has to be incredibly old for these processes to take place. The picture on the right I took last weekend on the Murray Coast um, at Hopeman. Um, that's my partner and his son for scale. Um, and you can see another unconformity. So those diagonal layers, they're actually the same rock as the vertical layers at Sicker Point. Um, they've also been uplifted into a diagonal position, eroded down, and another, sands, another sandstone on top. Um, the upper one is about 250 million years old. Okay. Um, okay, that's it. Anyway, so this idea of deep time was fairly wild even then. Um, John Playfair, who was in the boat on the day that they found the unconformity, um, <coughs> said, the mind seems to grow giddy by looking so far into the abyss of time. And then Hutton himself um, came up with, this is so gothic, we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. He's talking about the processes as 
basically unending. They never end. So I'm, I'm hoping to persuade you that deep time, um, the deep time of geological timescales is inherently Gothic. OK, so geology is about decay, endless decay, remaking, um, rebuilding and then eroding and starting again. This is inescapable cycle. Um, and in the in the sense that it's mind blowing and even the looking at the things like mountains and glaciers and what have you, I think there's a good argument for saying that it is sublime as well. Um, it's deadly. So this stuff absolutely doesn't care about humanity. So, you know, if you fall off a cliff, meh, that's you. Um, but at the same time, I think we can say it's beautiful and, and, you know, just thinking about being able to dig into rocks and finding maybe a diamond or maybe a monster. Those are cool. So there's another thing I need to tell you. Um, this is about how to make mountains. OK, you probably did some of this at school, maybe in geography or in science. Um, so sorry if this is a bit basic, but we'll get through it. Um, the map on the right uh, shows the world. So the red lines are the boundaries of plates. So the Earth's surface is not a solid shell. Um, it's a series of plates that move uh, in particular ways. Uh, and it's a cycle of, of destruction and creation. So here we're back to this theme again. Um, you get different kinds of plate boundaries. If you have a look at the line down the middle of the um, Atlantic, um, where the arrows show the plates are moving apart. This is a divergent plate boundary. Um, a new crust material kind of comes up as the old material moves apart and it forms new crust. So if you've been to Iceland, you'll have seen some of the, the volcanic activity that's, that's typical of um, a divergent plate boundary. So to balance out divergent plates, you need convergent plates. So these are plates colliding together. Um, for example, if you could see India. So the Indian plate is moving northwards into the Eurasian plate. And that's why Himalayas. Um, likewise, uh, on the western side of South America, you can see there the um, Pacific plate, the oceanic plate pushes into the continental plate. And the result is the Andes. OK, the diagram on the left is uh, sort of four snapshots, if you like, of the world over the last 225 million years in terms of where the land masses have been. OK, um, Pangaea uh, is not the start of it all. This is, you know, one stage in the process. And slowly over time, the, the continents as we know them have moved apart. And we know that, for example, Pangaea existed because you can see the same fossils and the same rock formations in different parts of the world. So um, the Appalachians, the Scottish Highlands and the Atlas Mountains are basically all part of the same mountain formation. Um, and they were right in the middle of Pangaea and it divided off into three different directions. Um, I should point out that the map um, bottom right of the planet as it is today, that's not the end point. It's going to keep going. OK, no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. This is unending. So let's have a quick look at some more convergent plate boundaries. So this is what happens. Uh, when you have convergent plates. So you might have two continental plates like India and Eurasia. They squish together and the rock layers get pushed up, making mountains, the Himalayas. You also get like um, the, the plate boundary on the west side of um, South America, a subducting plate. So the, the oceanic plate goes underneath and it pushes up um, and causes mountain building above it. Uh, 
that's a really nice little cartoon um, of the uplifted mountain and the subducting cat. So those, um, that's Alana McGillis. Uh, AlanaMcGillis.com has got loads of really nice cartoons explaining quite tricky scientific concepts. It's really nice. Um, and the last thing in the section before we stop for questions is the technical name for mountain building is orogeny. Yes, you can giggle. You've got time to do it now. Okay, let's pause for questions. All right, so let's have a look at some texts. Move forward, you know you want to. Okay, okay we're going to start off with Dracula. Um, I think most people are aware of Dracula, if if not, um, having actually read the um, the book. So Dracula is set in the Southern Carpathians. So the map on the right hand side, right in the middle, there's a there's a crescent shaped mountain range. That's the Carpathians. Um, and the, the Transylvanian part is uh, sort of the lower part of this curve. Um, the Carpathians are part of the Alpine orogeny, which is the result of the um, African continental plate colliding with the um, Eurasian continental plate. Um, that plate boundary is still active which is why you still get these massive earthquakes um, places like Turkey and Italy and Greece. Um, the main phase of um, the mountain building was sort of 65 million years ago until about two and a half million years ago. Um, and yes, it, it is really technically still ongoing. Um, Dracula then, um, if you haven't read it, a quick summary of the book. Um, so it's a collection of letters between the different characters, starting off with Jonathan Harker in Transylvania, having gone there to do um, some lawyering business um, for this strange guy, Count Dracula, who's buying some land in England. Uh, Harker finds himself effectively imprisoned in the castle. Um, meanwhile, uh, back in England, um, things are going badly for his fiancee Mina's friend Lucy, who <coughs> gets attacked by a creature in a graveyard, um, falls ill, and uh, Van Helsing is, is summoned because it's suspected that it's a vampire attack. Um, they try all kinds of things um, to cure her or protect her, but in the end, um, she's actually killed by a wolf, which is um, the vampire in wolf form. Uh, at this point though, Lucy is a vampire herself, and so they, they have to kill her. Um, Mina has been off to Budapest to collect Harker um, and they all, they return to England and the sort of the gang <laughs> um, set off in pursuit of Dracula, um, winding up back in um, the Carpathians, tracking him down to his castle and killing him. Okay, so, so much for the story. So the first, Little extract comes from chapter one. So this is from one of Jonathan Harker's letters. Um, and I'll read it for you. Right and left of us, they towered with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing out all the glorious colours of this beautiful range, deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags till these were themselves lost in the distance where the snowy peaks rose grandly. <clears throat> so the, um, let me tell you a little about the geology of this and, and why um, this description actually fits quite nicely. So the, the Carpathians, it's, it's um, like most mountain ranges, it's a series of what are technically known as naps. So these are folds, if you like. You know, if you, you push a, a tablecloth and it kind of wrinkles up and then the bigger wrinkles fall over the top of the smaller ones. That's effectively what you're getting here. Um, and it means that you get layers that are all jumbled up. So they're not in 
chronological sequence as you would expect from bottom to top. You can have older rocks underneath um, younger rocks, but also on top of younger rocks. And these different layers, depending on the, the, the type of rock, will um, erode differently. So something like sandstone will erode away reasonably quickly. Whereas a, a metamorphic rock is um, much tougher, much harder to erode. And um, metamorphic rocks are, they started off as things like sandstone, limestone, and then under extreme pressure or heat, such as during an orogeny, um, they kind of melt. And when they cool down, they've turned into something else, but with the same chemical constituents. So for example, something you might be familiar with is slate used as roof tiles, um, used to be blackboards and things like that were slate. Um, and that's what you get when you metamorphose shale. And shale is essentially a rock made from clay. Think about how fine the, the particles are in clay. So you subject that to heat and pressure and you end up with something you can put on your roof. So with the, the mountain being made of these folds, these naps, it, it means that you end up with mountain ranges frequently having kind of ridges that all run in the same direction. So parallel ridges with steep gorges in between um, where the rock has eroded away. So you get these lines of mountains going into the distance. Um, and in uh, young mountains like the Carpathians, um, you get sort of more, more cragginess, more pointiness, because they've simply not had time to erode. Next extract. OK, two little extracts from chapter two. So it says the castle is on the edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. The second one, to the west was a great valley and then rising far away, great jagged mountain fastnesses, rising peak on peak, the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone. So here we've got talk of what is essentially decay. Okay, we've got a chasm, a precipice, cracks and crevices. Um, the rock is being eroded by water or, or broken by um, extreme temperatures and ice. Um, plants are taking advantage of these, these cracks and crevices, finding a place to, to grow and making the cracks bigger, adding to the erosion again. Um, I know I keep talking about the Carpathians as being relatively young, relatively young, but Rivers don't tend to make chasms overnight. Um, that's you know millions of years of water working on stone. Um, and so this, this decay began the moment that the mountains began to rise. It wasn't mountains appeared and then at some time after that, the erosion began. No, it was all happening from the very beginning. So everything happens at the same time. Um, and at some point, in millions of years into the future, the Carpathians will be nice little rounded hills. Um, and uh, there you go, deep time, I suppose. Okay, let's have a look at the second book. So the second book is Hoarfrost by Jordan L. Hawk. Um, this is a book in the Wyborn and Griffin series. Um, I don't know if you've, you've read them. This is book six in the series. And if you're not familiar with them, um, they are two gay men living in a, a version of the USA in the 19th century that's kind of much like the one that we know from history, except with the Cthulhu mythos layered on top. Um, so you don't have the, you know, the racism and the myth, uh, misogyny of Lovecraft, but you do get to keep the tentacles and screaming. Um, that's the best bit. Um, this particular book is analogous to um, the Lovecraft book At the Mountains of Madness, um, except the protagonists actually go north rather than south to the Antarctic. The basic story is that Griffin, 
receives a letter from his long lost brother asking for help in investigating an archaeological find that he's dug up um, in a gold rush town of Hoarfrost in Alaska. Um, the gang sets out to solve the mystery. They quickly realise, though, that there's more to it than just this artefact. And in actual fact, they've got to try to prevent the opening of a portal between dimensions that's going to you know, unleash all manner of nasty beasties on the world um, if they can't get to it in time. Um, the <coughs> they end up discovering an, an ancient city under a glacier. Um, and there you have your, your denouement of fighting eldritch beasts and naughty humans. Um, so by following the, the places mentioned in the book, um, Horfoss itself doesn't exist, but there are other towns mentioned along the route. So I followed those. And so the, the setting for this is the Brooks Range in Northern Alaska on your map on the left. So this is, um, it's a range of mountains that's right at the top of the Rockies. There's, there's some debate between the USA and Canada as to whether it is actually a part of the Rockies. Um, <clears throat> but if you follow the Rockies up and then off the end of that, you'll find the, the Brooks Range. The rocks in it are mostly marine deposits. So about 500, mi million, 500 million years old. So fossils from the bottom of the sea. So really old, and it means you get things like trilobites, um, brachiopods, like clams, so little bivalves, things like that. Obviously, the mountain range itself is not as old as that. Um, it started to rise about 145 million years ago um, and took about 30 million years. And in this case, it's slightly unusual because the, the oceanic plate, which came from what's now the West, um, the Pacific plate, didn't go under the continental plate. For some reason, it got stuck and it piled over the top, um, such as why you've got these sort of folds and stacked up layers of marine deposits, which is a little bit unusual. So let's have a look at the book. So the, <coughs> the Brooks Range. Um, I've got few little clips here so let's have a look at some of these. So the first one says beyond the camp the mountains rose sharply up their flanks of bare rock mantled with snow. The great mass of a huge glacier wended down the valley towards us a river of ice creeping inexorably onward. And we've also got the mountains loomed up to the north snow-clad peaks reflecting the light so they appear to have been dipped in blood. That's a nice gothic image. I like that. Um, so snow, ice, glaciers in this one. Um, the Brooks Range is the, the tallest um, mountain range in the Arctic Circle. So although it's not particularly high, it's only about two and a half thousand metres. Um, because it's so far north, it has glaciers. Um, there's more than a hundred uh, that have been uh, identified. <coughs> And glaciers are, are agents of erosion, if you like. So they, they move like incredibly slow rivers. Um, they can be hundreds of meters deep. And as they move, they, they grind away the rock that they sit on. So the bottom and the sides of the glacier. And you can always tell whether a valley has been formed by a glacier by its profile. So it's cross section. Uh, a valley formed by a glacier is U-shaped. So if you think of, um, Scottish glens, for example, um, compared to a, a river valley, which would be V-shaped. Um, glaciers themselves are not massively old. Um, most of them are remnants of the ice sheet from the last ice age, which ended about 10,000 years ago. Um, even in human terms, that's, that's a long time though. Have a look at the next clip. All right, the next one, uh, we emerged onto a balcony with a low wall overlooking the great rift dividing the city. Below us lay the ancient watercourse long dead. The glowing slime cast an eerie blue glow over everything 
and high above us the belly of the glacier groaned as it crawled slowly down the mountain. So here they are in the, this ancient city <coughs> under the glacier. Um, okay, so I've got a glacier again. We've also got a, a rift. Um, so we've got um, ancient water erosion with a glacier over the top. I really like how the, the, the glacier kind of groans and crawls, you know, like it's a living thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever been near a glacier. Um, they're cool to visit if you do have a chance, but be really careful. They're very dangerous. And they're also surprisingly noisy. So they, they creak and they crack and they groan and they grind um, and they kind of they squeak um, as pieces move around. Um, and of course, slow things are described as being glacial in speed. So nothing happens quickly with a glacier. Um, and our third text is podcast, Old Gods of Appalachia. Um, <clears throat> they've just finished season two. Um, it's described as an eldritch horror anthology set in an alternative Appalachia. Um, and the story is kind of span a time from the end of the 18th century up until the 1930s. Um, you can listen to episodes of standalone stories or little groups of episodes and make up one story. But I actually really enjoy listening to the whole thing and making all the connections between the, the, the characters and the places and the monsters and these things. Um, it's pretty creepy, but it's definitely worth checking out. Um, be aware though that uh, there are content warnings for it. So have a look at those on oldgodsofappalachia.com um, if there are things you find unsettling. Anyway, so onto the map. The Appalachians are a long uh, chain of mountains. So the eastern side of the US and they go up into, into Canada as well. Um, the podcast is set in the, the southern portion of the ranges. Um, and it names the, the Blue Ridge Mountains in several episodes. That gives me an earworm. I don't know if it does you. Um, the Appalachians are old, like with a capital O, they're ancient. There are rocks in there that are more than a billion years old. Um, they're too old for fossils. <laughs> there wasn't anything uh, around when they became rocks. Um, and uh, many of them have been turned, uh, have been metamorphosed into things like marble and slate and quartzite and granite and things like that. On the, the western side of the range was uh, an ancient sort of shallow marine environment. So like a shallow sea, something like that. And so limestones and sandstones formed there and importantly coal deposits. So this is, these are some of the richest coal deposits in the world. We'll come back to the coal in a minute. Um, the Alleghenian orogeny began about 300 million years ago. Um, and so it did the, the usual folding and faulting thing. Um, and when the, the Appalachians originally formed, they were as high as the, the Himalayas. So massive, right? But then think of all that time that they've spent eroding down. And remember that I said that the Appalachians, the Scottish Highlands and the Atlas Mountains are part of the same formation. But they've ended up looking very different because of the different climates that they've ended up in. <coughs> um, and in fact, the, the Appalachians are, are not much more than 2000 meters high in places. So um, little hills, really. We'll have a look at a couple of excerpts from the, the podcast. Um, the first one's actually from the, the website. So um, this comes from the about page of the website. It gives you a taste of where they're heading, I think. It says, long before anyone lived in these hills, beings of immeasurable darkness and incomprehensible madness were entombed here. It was during this bygone age when the Appalachians towered much higher and more menacing than the gentle slopes and ridges we know today, that they were conscripted after a great battle to serve as the final prison for those dark forces. But of course, time marches inexorably on, eons past, and the walls of the prison begin to wear thin. 
and things that slumbered soundlessly below for millennia began to stir and become restless. In the podcast, this is delivered in, in this amazing, like, Tennessee, Kentucky um, accent. I can't even begin to do that. Um, so we've got reference here to the original height of the, the mountains, um, and it notes sort of erosion, sort of wearing away the, the walls, making the walls to the prison thinner. So, you know, it took more than 200 million years to reduce the Appalachians to the current size, so wind and water chipping away at the mountains. And I really like how Old Gods of Appalachia actually leans really hard into deep time. So we get things like bygone age, and eons and millennia. Um, and I think it points to an, an understanding of the geological cycle of erogeny and erosion, this sort of ongoing, never ending, but incredibly slow process of, of recycling. Um, and onto that is mapped the, the mythology of, of Old Gods. Um, and I think that wouldn't the, the the mythology wouldn't work if the mountains were younger. Um, I mean, beings of darkness are not nearly as scary if they're only you know hundred years old or something. And then on to our last little extract. This one says, "There are places in this world that humanity was never supposed to see, walled in by mountains of burning black rock." isolated by a choking canopy of poison flora, woods where tooth, claw and hunger still sit atop the food chain. Long before our kind ever set foot in these mountains, when the peaks of the Blue Ridge towered above the stars and the heart of the plateau still rolled with ridges tough as pine knobs, darkness was brought here in cages made of fear. Cool that, huh? So again, we've got we've got great age, the peaks being uh, much higher than today. But we also get our reference to coal, so mountains of burning black rock. Um, and I mentioned before that the coal is the remnants of trees. Um, uh, so this these are uh, remnants that that formed in this shallow marine environment from trees. Um, that were growing on sediment. Um, so these uh, these coal deposits are so the Carboniferous, which is 300, 360 million years old. Um, most coal around the world was formed at that time, but where I'm sitting right now um, in central Scotland uh, was a, a massive coal field at one time. And the rock here is Carboniferous, it's the same stuff. Um, so you end up, so what happens to make coal is that you've got trees growing on um, like a river delta or a river island, something like, like that. You know, in rivers you get sandbanks and mud banks growing, uh, building up, and then you get stuff starting to grow on them. So it's that kind of thing on a bigger scale. Um, and the Carboniferous stuff was big, um, like massive enormous dragonflies a meter long and that kind of stuff. So you've got your, your trees and, and plants growing on um, sediment. This is then flooded, okay? Everything kind of dies, falls down and is covered by more sediment. And then that, that sediment over the top stops the organic matter from decaying. And it, it ends up sandwiched between layers and you get coal, Obviously, over millions of years, this may happen a number of times. And so you end up with these layers of coal sandwiched between layers of sediment. And then during the, the formation of the mountains, so the rock was all folded over on itself. And you end up with um, sequences of rocks, again, out of order. So like I, I mentioned before. Um, and so there'll be places where um, the coal was nearer the surface and other places where it was covered by a layer of much harder rock. But eventually these would erode away since 200 million years of erosion. Uh, the coal would be exposed and you end up with what uh, sort of continues to be a huge coal mining industry um, in parts of the Appalachians. Um, and in fact, coal mines, the mines themselves provide uh, one of the threads of the, the, the early stories in um, the podcast. Okay. 
And there we go, we're skidding into our final parking place. So that brings me to um, towards my conclusion. Um, so let me just finish off by going back to my suggestion that geology is inherently Gothic. Okay. The, con the concept of, of deep time allows for the invention of gods and monsters that are older than humanity can fathom. Okay. We've got these unending processes of decay and erosion. Um, we've got towering mountain peaks, inexorable glaciers. Um, there's a, a glimpse of the sublime, I think. We've got this deadly, dangerous side of it, you know, fall down a ravine, get lost in a mine. Uh, quite scary, all of these things. And then at the same time, you know, it is beautiful, whether you're looking at a glacier or a mountain or a, a diamond or a fossil. OK, um, I hope I've persuaded a few of you that geology is inherently Gothic. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'll have a go at answering them. <laughs>